Okay, so we're asking dumb uh, SEO questions. Each week um, we uh, meet to answer the questions asked on the SEO questions community on Google+. Plus. Um, with us tonight we have Masataki Wasa. I, I did say, uh, I, I missed saying Dan's name first, but I'm, I won't give you his surname because uh, we don't want to lose the best programmer in the world. Um, uh, anyway, Masataki Wasa is webmaster at wasaweb.net. Um, he's also a Google Top contributor on the AdSense and uh, a Google Plus Help community. Um, Michael Fisher Kirshner recently uh, returned from uh, vacation in the uh, South Pacific. Um, he uh, is SEO manager for Zazzle.com. Um, Zazzle.com, purveyors of 32 million products and counting. Um, Tim Kappa is um, um, well. According to Tim's script here, he says that he's the uh, best conversion rate optimization specialist in the world. He is uh, the uh, only SEO that Google is afraid of, but I, I think that uh, Linda Nah has that title. Um, he um, operates from uh, the backwoods of London, uh, out there in um, uh, is it uh, the Midlands uh, they call it. Uh, okay, um, right. Um, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> I am hopeless. All right, our first uh, question tonight. Um, oh, I've got to do something else first. Oh, sorry, guys. There we are. All right. Our, our first question tonight uh, is from Louise uh, uh, bin uh, Mahamad. Um, he wants to know if his website will be having an edge over hundreds of other websites. Um, he's, uh, Louise says, uh, hello, guys. Uh, first a question, um, then uh, a suggestion uh, re request. I purchased a website uh, which had uh, zero uh, unique content. Uh, everything was copied word to word. Um, now I'm trying to make it unique, providing services. Uh, so uh, I just have around 17 pages for which I have to write unique content. My question is, will my, will my website be having an edge over hundreds of other websites with copied content and I have uh, unique content? He goes on to say uh, um, a, a suggestion a, a about our, our weekly um, videos in which uh, we answer the questions. He said, I am from Pakistan. YouTube is blocked here, sadly. Uh, is there a way that I can see these videos or if you can upload it on some other medium as well uh, where followers like me uh, can watch these videos too? Uh, thanking you in advance. Um, we put it out to Moise that um, he can download the audios um, from SoundCloud um, and also on the download page on uh, the WCAQuestions.com site, um, we've added a text-only uh, YouTube link so that he can paste that into uh, a, a, a Tor-like um, uh, um, method to uh, watch the videos, even though that uh, YouTube is, is blocked in um, Pakistan. All right. Um, in, who has a comment for Moise? Uh, well, let's see. Um, okay, so brand new site, 17 pages, and other sites have copied content. Uh, if it yeah, the problem is this site is fairly new, and unless he's swinging hard out of the gate um, with a lot of people talking about his site, uh, sadly, even kind of copied content is going to be um, doing better than his. Um, and if the copy content is of his own site, if the copy content actually has a higher, uh, let's just say, authority or page rank, not the toolbar, but the generic one, um, there's still a good likelihood that they'll outrank his website. Uh, it's just kind of one of those unfortunate things where, um, you yeah, you need some promotion of the site, um, 
to to kind of start to rank, you know, decently. Let's just say, um, <clears throat> and that's not to say that seventeen is uh, e even enough pages. Um, yeah, it, it, it's you know, building the site is only half the battle for the most part. You need others to talk about it, uh, and that's generally in a lot of ways through kind of links. Um, so. You know, you want to get out there and start promoting and, and help to add that edge over a lot of other websites, um, you know, for, for kind of the same terms. But, um, you know, it also depends on the competition, like who's out there, who are you trying to rank over. And uh, if there are a lot of larger sites or more established, it's going to potentially take a bit for you to get up there. So don't, uh, depending on who you're up against, you, know, you may need to uh, prepare yourself for a long battle. Cool. Anybody else? Okay, Louise, uh, I, I hope um, that you're happy with that. If not, uh, please uh, ask again on the SEO Questions community on Google+. We now have a question from Paul Kurana. He said, my website has an unnatural backlink profile from... Uh, um, a WordPress domain. He said, I need help. Um, my website has an unnatural backlink profile. The domain that was created uh, by a, a previous SEO company I hired. I, I want to know, uh, is there any way to remove spam and delete a WordPress blog um, without having a username and password? Um, I appreciate your help in advance. No, unfortunately not. I mean, if you if you don't have um, access to that site, the cPanel, where it's hosted, um, or FTP details, unfortunately, you can't access that. And I'm assuming this other company that, that set it up probably hosting it themselves. So uh, I doubt that would give you the, the admin. Um, or perhaps you could ask them. There is always that possibility. The other, the, 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 your next logical step is to use a disavow tool in Webmasters Tools and disavow the entire domain. Don't worry about all the the the, the individual pages that link. Just do a, just uh, do the actual domain, and you know that's it. End of story. Um, and that that's protecting yourself, and that's protecting your site. I do that sooner rather than later because there may or may not be another penguin by the end of this year. So if it's really unnatural, um, I would disavow those as soon as. And that is your sort of safety net. Cool, that Tim. Okay. Um Sorry for the uh, technical issue with the size of the text. We're, we're just working on that. Um, Hashim um, Warren uh, asks a question. Why uh, is Google showing the MET keywords for this site in the search engine results pages um, when Bing and uh, Yahoo are not? Um, and uh, he gives a link uh, leading to uh, uh, fitzphotocom. What does he mean by um, the met keywords? I think he meant meta. Meta keywords. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's photo. Oh god, flash. It's a flashlight. No. That's probably a good reason why. Um, oh god, is there content on this page? Or a bit? Um, I mean, one of my one of my s suggestions here is, oh yeah, god, it's a flashlight. Um, <laughs> 
but uh, you know, Google choose to display. Uh, actually, hang on. Let me just look at that image again. There's like no content, so there is no content. So Google's trying to figure out what is the the best thing to show. Now they're showing, yeah, snippets of some of the keywords. Um, the description probably not because the description. You know, it talks about it's a premier photography studio in Duluth, and I'm assuming that's Minnesota, where it's got nothing to, to kind of back that up. Um, there must be something. Ah, hang on. It, it obviously feels they're more relevant to the description. It's interesting that they're choosing the the, the keywords in this case when he it looks like at least he's only searching for Fitz photo. Yeah. So what, what kind of Masataki is saying in the chat there, it's weird. It is. I, I kind of thought that perhaps it had chosen those ones because I, I thought maybe it, it can't find anything do, else. <laughs> yeah, and, and also it had to do with something maybe of the, uh, the, the images because obviously just for the image, the title of the images, but I've gone down and I can't, you know, the image titles aren't even titled. I thought perhaps it was making some kind of connection based on the, the image yeah. titles, but it's I would, not. <laughs> yeah, this is just pretty much, you get, it's a flash site, there's next to no content or information, and it's gonna, you're going to find these odds, you know, I call them niche corner cases type situations. Um, the, the main page needs content. <laughs> Uh, you could probably add a paragraph, and I wouldn't be it, with the word "fits photo" in it somewhere, and I wouldn't be surprised if the meta description is, is shows up instead afterwards. But because, yeah, I think Tim's right. It's just there's nothing else there. Uh, more or less, provide the I guess the meta keywords in this case. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a little clause somewhere where Google says we don't, you know, we've been ignoring meta keywords for like. 10 years now, but <laughs> clearly not. Um, for some reason, they found those on there more appropriate to the site in the description. Fair enough. <clears throat> OK, um, let's um, mo move on uh, to the next. Um, I have a question here from um, a good friend of uh, WCA Questions, Narajya Kumar, and um, the question is titled Insight Search Within a Google Search Engine Results Page. Um, he said, I searched GoDaddy and the, the result on Google was um, with site search in GoDaddy, where you can search for a domain or anything within the within uh, um, the GoDaddy site from the Google search engine uh, result pages. Um, he provides um, the, the screenshot. This is that uh, something new from Google, isn't it? Excuse me. Um. Yeah, this is new Google's. Uh... Yeah, you have to have um, your own internal site search um, integrated on your site, and then Google will pick that up and use it within the search box in search results. If you don't have site search 
implemented on your own site, then if someone uses the search box, it just then creates a new search, uh, a new search query with a site query. Um, so, for example, if you didn't have the um, site search uh, implemented on your site and you typed into that GoDaddy one saying register domain, then the new query, because you don't have it installed, would be site colon register domain. And then it would just provide you with another list of pages from, obviously, GoDaddy um, in a search result page. But yeah, uh, you need to install the site search onto your own site for it to filter across, I believe. I haven't had a site with authority that actually produces the search query for the brand name, um, but when it does, I shall be testing. Yeah, if you're pretty authoritative, um, <clears throat> in some cases, Google will just do it on its own, so you don't have yeah. to add that. You know. And I've noticed they still come and go. I noticed, like, Audi had it last week, don't have it this week. Um, they they still coming and going. I, I don't know how they... Perhaps they put them on, leave it for a week or two, let you see if the webmasters realize, then, in you know, implement site search on their site. If they don't, then they take it away, give it another week or two, then add it back. I don't know how they're doing it or why, but... Really just doing a general test to see what works better for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, have we covered it? <coughs> I'm going to record that as a yes. Uh, here's one from um, um, Sammy Candlewell. Uh, Sammy asks uh, about site downtime. He says, uh, hi guys, I, I want to know about the uh, downtime uh, of my... Uh, I'm sure he means downtime of my site. Um, if, if my site uh, does go down, um, for how much time will it no longer be in, in the search, search engine results pages? I think that's what he means, uh, how to get this information. I, I think this is a question where um, if, if he sites down, he wants to know, because uh, Googlebot stops, uh, drops, drops sites from the index if, if, they're, if they're out of contention. Um, he wants to know how long it takes before it comes back. Does that make sense, or am I misreading it? Um, no, I mean, I think that makes sense. Um, I'm just trying to recall. Like, yeah, the larger the site, um, you know, if you're a small site and you're down and Google doesn't crawl you often, it's you'll probably be okay the longer you're down, but the larger you get, <coughs> um, the longer you're down, the kind of um, quicker you'll see your site out of the search results. Um, it also depends on what kind of downtime and how your server responds. Um, if it's a, you know, 500 error temporary type issue, you know, hey, you'll be down for a little bit and back. Um, it, and of course, um, it also depends on if the whole site is down versus only partially. Um, I've been in situations <laughs> where parts of sites are down. Like we we uh, had certain sections of our sites down, and it made our website look like spam. Um, that was fun. Uh, so like it, it it all depends on kind of what's down. If it's, if it's the whole site and it's showing like a fun and it's not, not horrible. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, as you're scrolling, you've got data at them for how. And there's a lot of different kinds of ping services. Um, Google Webmaster Tools will provide you notices if there's a, suddenly a large increase in certain kind of, of errors, 404s, 500s, etc. Um, but yeah, um, ping them, alert site, all those types of uh, and, and we'll provide and, and help with that. Just be aware of how those get set up so your analytics tracking doesn't get all foobar. Um, but uh, usually if it's just a general, you know, you're down for a little bit and you're back, 
um, it, it's not going to be uh, too horrible. Um, Google kind of has the ability to recognize, oh, okay, the site is temporarily down. It's showing me a 500 error, and now it's back. Yeah, they'll, they'll put it back in the search results pretty quickly. Okay. I see Dave Elliott on the SEO questions community on Google Plus also mentioned um, using Pingdom. Um, one that um, I, I um, would recommend anybody try, and that's the uh, Paceler router traffic grapher. They've got a, um, a, a magnificent tool that does um, really good monitoring. Um, and there's a free version that you can get that um, you can use to monitor up to 30 sites. Um, really recommend it. It's free. Um, and um, you'll probably find yourself buying the tool for the uh, additional parts of it. But it's Paceler, P-A-E-S-S-L-E-R. Um, and we were paid to say that. <laughs> uh, any, anybody else? All right. Um, the um, uh, next next one on our list. Uh, it's number six. Um, it's a question um, from Gurav uh, Gutem. Uh, please tell me how to solve this issue. Uh, he says, "Hello, I have a question. My site is open on uh, uh, https www.pagergenius.com. Um, anything." Um, you can type after the slash. Um, oh, is he saying he puts anything after that? Heavens. Uh, is it good for SEO? And if it is not good, please tell me how to solve this issue. So this is basically you're opening potentially yourself up to spam. Um, uh, it, it, it's yeah, you know. Basically, think of it like this: if if anybody can put anything in there, they can more or less create a lot of either duplicate content on your site if they start linking to it and Google finds it. Um, these are poor pages potentially, which means um, you're at risk for Panda if there's a lot of those. Um, you, you know, you can have soft four fours, which look bad in the same way and can, can have issues. Um, you know, it might be seen as a um, as a, a, a showing Google if if it provides back a search result only. And as a, generally, as a smaller site, if you look like you're being shown as a search result um, versus actual kind of pages, then um, Google generally prefer, prefers not to have search results within its own search results, uh, and so it may not want to show you as much. So it's it's things that you should kind of be concerned about and fix, um, whether it's um, not allowing certain pages uh, to be created, except for the ones you have, or creating 4.4s if people are doing those searches. Um, where it works easiest on your implementation system, um, it is something that you should uh, eventually fix if it's if it's you know something that you see a lot of people doing. Right. Anybody else? I see on the. Yeah. Um, you yeah, def too. yeah, definitely sort it out. And you also see it a lot on sort of um, sort of misconfigured e-commerce sites where you've got uh, where they're using search parameters also, and you can get multiple massive URLs based on what search parameter someone selected on. Um, and yeah, you don't you don't re you don't you, you don't want those indexed, and you, you want to canonicalize them back to the originating source. Um, and yeah, you know, you need to. If somebody can, if anybody can create a URL and add it on there, that's you're opening yourself up to a world of problems, uh, not only from from exploits, but from um, you know, just for a totally messy site um, and potential penalties all over the place. So yeah, I'd I'd, I'd rectify the that problem. Excellent. Hello, Alice the Lattimore. 
Hi, guys. Um, uh, on the uh, SEA questions community on uh, Google Plus, uh, um, D Dave Elliott uh, said it sounds like you don't have a 404 error page, and instead it's set to divert back to your home page. I, I stumbled across a classic um, this week uh, on um, one of our client sites that we host but we didn't build. And um, I, I spoke to the developer and I could not convince him, but uh, anyway, I'll, I'll run it past you guys and you tell me if I was wrong to try and talk him out of it. But uh, anyway, he has a, a 404 page um, which flashes up for five seconds and then does a, 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 um, a meta refresh um, to the home page. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Anyway. Why would, he, why were they doing that? Well, I don't, I don't know why he's doing it, uh, but uh, they, they, I just noticed that's how they had it set up because I was, uh, uh, they, they switched the site um, a, a week ago and I was just checking uh, some of the sites from a, a site query, uh, some of the pages from a site query, and I, I noticed that where, where there were missing pages, um, that that's what they were doing with them. I thought, how did I get here? I, all of a sudden I was on the home page. Um, and, and, and yes, I mean, Google gives guidance not to use the meta refresh uh, um, even uh, for, for any purpose, uh, let alone on the 404. Well, I wonder what would happen there. Um, what would Googlebot, uh, how would Googlebot see that? It, it um, because I remember one of my old friends that uh, used to make chocolate. They, uh, they, they all of a sudden installed this meta refresh across all their pages. And um, it was quite interesting. Some pages were seen as normal, uh, whereas other pages, um, Googlebot was just uh, seeing them as 404s, soft 404s. In some instance, it couldn't kind of get his head around the meta refresh a a anywhere. Um, and of course, uh, rankings were dropping because Googlebot sees it, it reads um, X amount of the page and then hits the meta refresh and then thinks, oh, I've got to disappear off to this page. So it was just a complete nightmare and they still have it on their side, but anyway. The um, funny thing is though, who will you know, support a meta refresh. They prefer that you don't use it. Um, but they support it. Yeah, yeah, they try and honour it, and they do try and follow it, but um, it's like a mess. It, it's just a, it's a mess on, on a lot of pages. Maybe because it's not a... Um, as strong a signal maybe as say a 301 redirect or even a temporary redirect for that matter. Maybe there's a higher chance that Google gets it wrong um, in terms of its likelihood that they'll honor the, the meta refresh compared to the exact same redirect but done at an HTTP level. Maybe that's why you saw strange behaviors with your chocolate website, friend's mm. chocolate website maybe. Well, it was across every page. It's just absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't Going back to that. In yeah, terms of the 404 just... page, I think, Jim, um, if the 404 page itself was returning an actual 404 status code, um, I don't think it matters what the meta refresh does. The, the page itself is going to get dropped from the index because of the 404, and then the redirect is going to send them back to the home page, for instance. Um, I suppose they're doing that because they think the home page is a better place for the customer than our 404 page. But, you know, what they probably should do is build a better 404 page. Hmm. Fair enough. I should. Uh, actually, I'll, 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 in the, in the, uh, if I can find a quiet time, I'll see if I can find, a, find one else. I'll, and uh, we can have another look at that. Okay, um, 
All right. Uh, question number seven um, is from Chuck Bolton. Um, and he said, uh, does Google penalize me for replicated content? He said, our site has replicated content in the following ways. Um, the answer to a, a question is the original and has a URL. The same answer to a question is replicated on a separate URL which aggregates the answers to several questions under a category. And the same answer to a question is replicated in the poster's user account. Um, does Google penalize me for this replicated content? So I think um, in general, no. Um, Google have gone on record plenty of times about saying that, you know, a bit of duplicate content in your site isn't going to cause too many problems. I suppose if it was rampant, um, you'd probably be more concerned. I suppose what um, Chuck should be looking at though is um, trying to avoid those kind of scenarios. For instance, if you're going to include a some portion of the question and answer on different URLs, he should look to minimize the amount of duplication. So for instance, he might only put the full answer um, on any one URL, uh, and then he might use an abridged version of the answer, um, the question and answer on other URLs that link through to the one page that carries the full question and the full answer. Uh, that way Google is most likely to return uh, that URL that's got the full question and full answer in search results and you're kind of minimizing the duplication. Uh, I suppose in a little way like what you see in a WordPress blog, you know, there's category pages and tag pages for instance. Um, it's obviously pretty common for a category page to include an excerpt of the post um, that links through to the actual post URL. And that's obviously completely okay. So maybe you could look to do something like that to, you know, improve things if you were concerned that maybe it was going to get out of control. Cool. Were you going to add something to that, Tim? No, I think Alistair summed it up. I think the, I think where you're just going to get into difficulty if it carries on over time, um, and obviously at what scale, is you know when you're replicating the same uh, answer and question on all the different categories, uh, or under uh, you know under different categories. Um, so yeah, I think Alistair's perfectly timed that just have a little excerpts linking back to your to the original one um, one thing is when you say the same answer to a question is in the post as user account um, perhaps you might uh, I, I don't quite understand what the, the the user account is so does that actually need to be visible can that one be uh, no indexed and followed because it's the actual post as user account uh, and because you've actually answered it on a, on a new URL in the very beginning. So you might not actually, you know, need to index that one, but it can be followed. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like Alistair said, it all depends on the amount going on, and, you know, ultimately it will eventually reach a point where, you know, they'll say, look, this is just full of thin content, um, and they'll just filter you out, really. Uh, a lot of pages. Okay. All right. Um, here's um, one. Uh, it's a topical question um, uh, regarding a private blog network, um, and uh, it's from Michael um, Tigulo. And, and Michael says, "I have a question regarding the blog network." Recently, Google announced that they were targeting sites uh, using private blog networks. So here's my question. Um, is guest blogging not effective anymore, and is it risky to do that kind of strategy? Uh, mostly, blogs who offer guest posting uh, um, is, a, is a blog network, uh, I think, uh, and they are using that guest posting site uh, for SEO purposes to exchange posts. 
Um, second question, uh, is, is a blog network still effective if you are using the right blogging convention? Looking forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, Google took down massive uh, PBNs. Uh, and pretty much anyone that was ever in some way, shape, or form connected to it or linked to it, even via who is on a site that wasn't taking part, uh, still got thin content uh, penalties. Um, the original My Blog Guest, and there were a couple of other ones around Europe, um, blogging communities that got hit earlier in the year. Um, they issued with they were issued with spam penalties, so the thin content one is is a serious, you know, for me that because it was essentially they're the same, but the PBN ones got thin content, which is going to be really difficult to sort out, because some of the ones that came out in public and said yes we got hit, are actually not thin. They are real heavyweight um, sites, um, so. How they're going to sort that out essentially is still a bit of sort of you know a bit of conjecture at the minute because they're not thin. So, but they need to sever their ties with these 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 private private blog networks. So now going back to your initial question is is guest posting still effective? Um, right. If you had the opportunity to write an article on a really high quality site, um, I would say yes, go and do it. If you had the opportunity to write on a mediocre site which gets relatively little or no traffic, um, all of their content is guest posted content, then I would say no because it will either just be devalued or over time you'll be looking at some kind of um, you know penalty or algorithmic penalty somewhere along the line. So weigh it up if you have the opportunity in terms of a really high quality um, authoritative site do it. If it's mediocre to worse than mediocre kind of sites that are just taking willy-nilly guest posts that aren't, you know, sort of, you know, and you, 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 you get what I'm saying. Then I probably wouldn't. Is Jim frozen, maybe? Or dead? More likely muted. I'm muted. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's me, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll look, I, my read on this is going to be much improved because I've, I've already had the chance to practice, so I suppose it's not a bad thing. Um, this is a question from Chris uh, Capucci who asks, um, what is the best or preferred way to list areas uh, uh, your company services uh, on your website? He said, I read some stuff on the web, however, they are relatively old posts and I don't want to spend time uh, creating URLs for each city, um, which was one of the suggestions, um, if that will not help. Uh, thanks in advance. This is a, um, for businesses that service multiple areas, this is an ongoing problem, I think, because if you don't carry the content for the regions or the cities that you want to target, you know, it's obviously pretty hard for Google to return you in search. Um, if you've got offices, if you've got a physical store that targets multiple areas, um, and you've got multiple shop fronts, you can obviously set up Google Places or Google My Business Profiles for each of your businesses in the towns or cities that you target, which is one way. Um, you could, um, in the My Business settings, you can change your um, business configuration so that it targets um, 
a radius instead of the suburb, so to speak. I think you can increase that to 100 or 200 kilometer radius of your address or something like that, I think, which could help you with being getting visibility into areas that's not the town that your business is physically located in. Um, on top of that, you probably do need to start thinking about ways that you can produce non-spammy content for the other areas that you're interested in targeting, um, however that might be. Um, maybe you could put together pay a couple pages on your site saying that you know we service these areas, um, lay out maybe the service costs for the areas if it differs from your local neighbourhood. You know, we'll charge you fifty dollars extra um, call out fees or order whatever it might be. Um, and then maybe start thinking about ways to uh, get your website listed into any other niche directories that target the towns or cities that you want to expand into that you're not physically located in as well. Like the local links from websites that Google can identify as being, you know, related to the areas that you want to expand into is obviously a good thing for you. So. Yep, it's, it's certainly um, a question we've discussed um, many times. Um, all right, I, I just wanted to point out um, that the tireless workers on the SEO questions community on Google Plus, uh, there's a couple of them on the screen there, Edwin Yonk and uh, Dave Elliott. I can't see the screen at the moment, guys, but is, is that on, on the board and you, you can read a book? Right, cool. Thanks, Mike. Um, but yes, Dave Elliott uh, and uh, Edwin um, uh, do so much um, good work and uh, help help us uh, do this job. I'm, it's really appreciated. Question uh, number ten on our run list uh, is um, uh, a question from uh, John uh, Pitcher. And uh, John asks, can you add keywords into the title tag and or uh, H1 uh, after indexing or will this trigger a penalty? He said, uh, on a WordPress site which is about three to four months old, a customer has created several key service pages without putting all of the proper keywords into the title or H1. Uh, for example, for an English course, he has a title, Learn English for Life Company Name Location. Um, without any mention of the word course. The word course does, however, appear on the page a few times. If he adds course into the title uh, and or the, the H1, um, will this trigger a penalty? No, it's not going to hurt him. Um, Google's obviously completely okay with you going back and editing a page, improving the quality of the content. Um, deleting stuff, fixing typos, you know, that's completely okay. Do it as often as you like. Um, obviously, when you're trying to test this stuff, looking for to measure the improvements, um, you can't continually keep changing it and expecting it to update, you know, one or two days later. It'll take time for Google to crawl and index um, the pages after you've made the changes and then for those changes to actually be reflected in the search results. But in terms of being able to make those changes, make them as often as you want. You know, obviously you should be striving for the highest quality, highest relevancy page that you can for the product and services you offer versus the type of phrases that customers are searching for your services for. Okay, Any, anybody else? All right, uh, John Pitcher, I, I hope um, that's what you're looking for. And uh, here is another question from John Pitcher. Um, it's about uh, NAP consistency across the web. Help me out, guys. What does NAP stand for? Name, address, phone. Oh, thank you. Name, address, phone. Consistency, consistency across the web. Uh, will it damage your SEO if your Facebook page has a different company name to your website and Google Plus page? A customer has a website and Google Plus page uh, XYZ Languages. 
but a Facebook page, SXYZ Language School. Um, his um, Twitter account uh, in uh, his personal name rather than his company name. Should he change his Facebook page, if he can, he has over 100 likes, or is it okay to leave as is? So, it's more of a local SEO problem. I mean, unless the names are fundamentally different, um, like uh, really different. Yeah, I haven't come across a, I mean, it's still called XYZ, but instead of calling it languages, the other one's got languages school. Mm. Um, I personally haven't come across a situation in, in local where I've seen Google changing something because of a Facebook page name was different. Mm. You tend to get things uh, if, let's say you've got 20 you know, like 20 listings out there, and out of those 20 listings, half of them were saying language of school and half were saying XYZ languages. That's when, and, and also it's sometimes the address. Now, I really don't think the Facebook thing is going to throw a spanner in the works. If you could change it, that would be great. But I don't think it's going to throw a spanner in the works, just a Facebook page being different to, uh, you know, what 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 else is uh, referenced um, online? Okay. Now I know what NAP means. Question number twelve uh, tonight uh, is from. Um, uh, Naboja Dujic, um, I'm sorry Naboja, I, I hope I got somewhere close to uh, pronouncing your name. Um, Naboja says, uh, hi guys, uh, here's a question about the best internal linking practices. Let's say we have the following pages. Home page is A, uh, an inner page is B and an another inner page is C. Um, we know that uh, A uh, linking to B linking to C linking is ideal. Um, is it bad if the C page links back to page B, um, i.e. A linking to B and B um, reciprocally linking to with C? Um, two inner pages link uh, link to each other, and the home page links to one of them. How can this affect the performances of the page C in uh, SEO? Yeah, so, yeah, this was fun. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, it, yeah, it, it, there are different models for how people think they should be built out. Um, I was, I and Dave Elliott, we were in the forum talk uh, in the community chatting about this with, with him and um, one other person, I don't know who right now. Um, and the model they were basing on was, was from from Moz. Um, and I, I'm more of, a bit more of a Wikipedia model uh, myself for some of that um, versus a pure Moz hierarchy in their, their learn SEO. So um, going beyond just kind of like assuming that it's only three pages, because we, we were starting with that, but obviously three, it really doesn't do much. If you start to multiply it further, um, then it, it just, uh, it, it really came down to kind of uh, your philosophy of, of how you should cite, uh, architecturally build a website. Um, and how you do that uh, you know, is fundamentally um, different viewpoints for that. And usually, yes, you want some function in the site to be fairly flat, you want others to be hierarchical, and you want kind of cross connections. Um, and so I generally cite a bit more with how Wikipedia builds their site with some of the cross connections to other topics and other areas. Um, Moz is a bit more just pure. Like, 
at least the learn SEO part is, is very much just top down. Um, and my view is I don't like that as much because uh, it doesn't provide the cross connections to different areas and topics that could be quite relevant and helpful to a user. But that's my my view from that. Yep. Um, I to put this really simplistically as well. Um, if it makes sense for users, link. If it doesn't, don't. I think people can get really hung up um, on how they link through sites. You know, which way is best? Should I link up and down and sideways and everything else? I think if there's a reason, a, a good user reason to link one way or the other from any page to any page, I think you should do it. You know, remember that the web is built upon links and they're meant to be interconnected. So in that regard, I think keeping it simple is a good idea. Um, I think that this discussion gets a little bit more gnarly, I think, when you've got a really big site because it becomes a little bit more important to try and um, herd page rank a little further down your site architecture so that you know you can help getting uh, you know tens of thousands, hundreds, millions of pages indexed if you've got a really, really big site. Um, but you know, most websites are never that big and it's probably overthinking the problem to start thinking about things like that in general. You know, Google's guidelines say link from your home page to your most important pages. Um, and then, you know, ultimately build websites for users. So if you're doing that in mind, um, I think you'll be okay. Okay. I saw a great, um, a great um, uh, uh, post on Google Plus on um, site architecture this week. Um, yeah. I can't think of where though. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Jim. That was um, <laughs> really helpful. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the best I got. <laughs> All right. Um, we we uh, now have a question from um, uh, Gore Jai. Um, who has two duplicate content pages uh, and looking for suggestions. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, you said I find that I have uh, two pages um, um, for the same content and one is um, using a query string like site.com uh, slash page equals deli and the other is um, site.com slash page slash deli. Um, now, um, what I am thinking uh, to make all of my URLs structured properly, like site.com uh, slash page hyphen deli. Um, the issue is uh, already I have two duplicate content pages, so I need uh, um, a suggestion. If I redirect using a 301 redirect, permanent redirect, um, site.com uh, slash page equals deli and, and uh, the other site to a, a, a good uh, URL structure. Um, oh, heavens above. I can't see, can't see this. Um, and is it a good idea? What, what, what would you suggest to me in this case? I study uh, the uh, internet a lot, but uh, I'm, I'm facing uh, issues in multiple redirects to the same page. Thanks. So, <clears throat> um, okay. So, so this let's let's go back a little bit to um, yeah, Alistair's previous point in um, previous question is to kind of simplify this. Uh, you're thinking about creating a third page now because one was equal, one was slash, and now one's going to have dash. Um, for the most part, you're, you know, there's not going to be a huge uh, pain difference between that equal slash or dash. Um, however, you don't want to be creating new pages. You've already got two potentially perfectly fine. Um, maybe it's a little less than ideal, but 
um, you've already got a system set up for either the page equal deli or the page slash deli. Um, I would suggest just choosing one of them, probably the one, the latter, and just redirecting all the, all to that same uh, structure there, rather than creating a whole new one. Um, you know, it's um, even if they were not the URLs were not search engine friendly and ideal, you know, even Matt Cutts has noted it's just generally it's better to just leave the structure that you have today because it's it's one it's usually a lot of work to change it. Um, the benefit you get from a slightly better stru better structured URL is, is on a smaller scale not very uh, valuable versus kind of some of the loss you get because a through one redirect will you do lose some of the, the link value when going through the redirects. Um, so it's in the end I would suggest just keeping one of the ones that you already have. Um, it's still pretty good. I don't think it's going to make a difference whether it's equal, slash, or dash. So just choose one and be consistent and redirect them all to that same uh, structure so you avoid the uh, duplicate content you have on the site. Yeah, Google in the past have said um, you know, if you have uh, if you want to change a URL structure, don't just change it for the sake of rankings because there's not a lot of point. Um, if you've got existing URL structures that rank OK um, and you'd prefer newer, cleaner structures, leave the old ones as they were and start publishing new URLs under a new format. That's completely OK. They don't need to all be um, uniform in format across your site if that's practical for you to do so and have different formats in different sections of your site, that's okay. Um, so I, I, unless you've got other good reasons to change it, um, I wouldn't be too fast about it, to be honest. Um, if it's a new site, then just change it and be done with it to whatever you want to use because you've got no links and equity anyway, so you know, just fix it early so you don't need to change it later. Um, if your site's well established and it's ranking, I'd be more cautious about deciding to do um, car blanche changes to URL structures, just because you've got to go and issue all of the redirects, and um, you know, often people get it wrong. Um, it can be avoided with testing, but if you don't need to change it, I wouldn't change it. Yep, that sounds pretty good to me. Sorry, I'm not really with it tonight, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm committing a few blunders, finding it difficult, difficult to drive this thing tonight. Um, okay, so uh, the, the next um, question we have is um, from the uh, inimitable uh, uh, Dave Elliott, who uh, just answered the previous question. Now he's got one of his own. Um, it's on meta tag monitoring tools, and Dave wants to know if any of us know of a decent way to monitor a website um, to, to see if page titles and meta descriptions and things like that change. Um, he said he can find a few extensions uh, and programs that will monitor for changes in content, but none seem to count the titles and, and meta descriptions in this. I've never even bothered to do this before. Um, you could come up and schedule a crawl of your website um, with Screaming Frog or URL Profiler or any crawling tool you want. Um, export the crawl data um, into Excel and then once a fortnight or once a month just do a big VLOOKUP and compare any values that have changed from the previous fortnight when you crawled the site last. Um, pretty lo-fi, but uh, cheap, easy, not a lot of effort. Um, but I've got no idea about a tool that would do all of that for you. Um, the only one in this I mentioned in the community, the only one I've heard often mentioned sometimes is something like Scrapebox, um, Screaming Frog, uh, it's good for your own, but if you need a competitor, sometimes I've heard 
uh, scrape box, and then you know, depending on if you're just wanting, if it's a small amount and you need to run it for a few pages, use Excel. Add a plugin like SEO Tools into it and uh, run JSON or regex onto the site. Um, you know, I've done that so it's just like a few pages. I just need to see it every so often for opening the file. It all basically goes to their site. Um, got the data I need, done. Um, you know, a small amount is not going to be a pain. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the, the site audit tool on Semrush? Uh, the, those the Semrush are the people that um, yes, give us that's a, um, the guru uh, tool to use. Good call. I forgot about um, mentioning that. So um, other tools. Um, I actually haven't taken a look at the the Semrush one, um, but there are tools out there that do um, kind of monitor your own titles and meta descriptions as well for you so that if there are changes, you can see that. Um, even your analytics can at least, like Google Analytics can pull in the titles. But uh, yeah, uh, there are tools that I will uh, uh, track that. Um, I forget, and I haven't seen uh, the SEM rushes to know the quality of that one. But yeah, those are those are great example, great, uh, great point there as well. OK. Um, question uh, 15 on our run list uh, is from, uh, again, the second question from N Nabozha uh, I hope I've got that closer this time, Nabozha. Um, he's, he has a website, um, um, he said, um, a website that promotes the same product but, it, but in many uh, different cities. Uh, he said, let's say that you uh, um, have a website that, that promotes the same product but in many different cities. You have many landing pages about that service in Paris, Lisbon, Barcelona, etc. Um, would you use the same title and meta description with only one variable, city, for all of those pages? Or would you try to make a unique title and meta for each of them? Um, example with the same titles, London House and Office Removals, Paris House and Office Removals, Barcelona house and office removals. Oh God, um, and and a few more hundreds of these for many cities around the world. Um, example with variations: um, London house and office removal companies, um, fine house and office removal in Paris, um, cheap office and house removal companies in Barcelona. What's your opinion on this? Right. Well, first, first thing that now, if you are targeting all these different cities, okay, and as you say, hundreds more of them around the world, I'm assuming these are for. If you had the Paris house and offer office removals, that would be for France, okay. And Barcelona house and office removals will be for people in Barcelona. Now, ordinarily, they wouldn't be searching for that in English. They'd be searching for that in their own language. And all those pages should technically be served in their own language with um, hreflang. Okay. Uh, then you then you wouldn't really have a problem because you would be sorting out the title based upon the correct uh, local. Uh, terminology on the way they would say it, okay, in their language. Um, if you were just going to go down this route and do hundreds of others, look, I really, unless you're creating I mean, do you have offices in all these cities? I mean, if someone was in Paris and they were looking for house and office removals, I'm assuming you had an office in there. So you could get the local office to write unique content for that landing page about Paris house and office removals. But if this is just going to be the same content rehashed, basically with a few words changed in between, I'm sorry, but this is not going to work for you. Um,
One thing to think about with this probably is um, take something like a, a big directory type website, like, um, like a Yelp. Yelp will have removal lists in every city, town, etc. across the US. Um, TripAdvisor will have every town and suburb in the world listed um, for hotel reviews or business reviews or restaurant reviews or something like that. So the prospect of having um, huge volumes of pages that are essentially the same but for a different city in itself isn't necessarily a problem so long as you can um, find a way to make sure you've got really great content on the page. If, if you're doing what Tim suggested and it's essentially the same page with minor differences, um, that's just not going to fly. If you're doing something like TripAdvisor or Yelp where you've got all of the different businesses listed on, a pack, on all of the different pages or hotels listed and customer reviews of those hotels and so forth, across hundreds or thousands or millions of destinations around the world. Um, that's okay, because there's good value in that for users that might come to the site. So I would think about those kinds of things um, as you're embarking on this little exercise of hundreds, a few hundred other cities in the world that you're targeting for office removals. Um, think of ways to try and make those pages unique, other than you know, it's word substituting London for Paris for Barcelona, etc. Yep. Okay. Um, I, 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 I think we've covered it, guys. We'll move on to the next. Here's a question from um, Faran Forza. Um, and uh, this attracted an absolutely brilliant response um, um, from Federico Sasso um, uh, on the, the community answers. Um, anyway, Farin asked, uh, my website's bounce rates uh, suddenly dropped uh, to 3.5% and 15% from over 80%. Uh, it began on the uh, 22nd uh, of uh, August. And um, on one website and the other in early September. Um, we didn't make any changes to the website but added a few new blog posts. I just wanted to know if any, anyone uh, has experienced the same pattern uh, in change of bounce rate or is it only me? Yeah, something sounds something sounds wrong from a few extra blog posts from jumping from eighty to fifteen and three and a half. I mean that's that's wow. Um I would check your tracking codes. Um something does sound wrong. It could also be that um, your, you've got event tracking. Um, so a bounce in Google Analytics is essentially um, a visit that's got a single interaction with the tracker. So the page view tracker fires once um, and then they leave the site. That's a bounce. If you call the tracker twice on that same page, um, that won't be considered a bounce because the tracker object fired twice. Similarly, if you're using um, events, the page view tracker fires and then the event tracker fires and then the event causes a second interaction with the tracker, that visit wouldn't be considered a bounce. Um, you can obviously um, send Google Analytics events as being non-interactive, which would cause the um, the bounce rate stuff to be unaffected by the events happening themselves. But it, I would have a look at anything like that that you might have in your site where you've got potentially misconfiguration of your tracker where it might be firing twice by accident, um, Google Analytics events that you might be firing. Um, you may have changed something from being um, 
a non-interactive event and they've become interactive and that's what's caused the bounce rate to fall. Um, on the date in question where you set it changes, find out whether or not you've got more page views going through your site, more visits going through your site. Find out what segment of the traffic is causing the bounce rate to come down. Is it all direct traffic? Is it from bots? Um, you know, there's a new thing in Google Analytics where you can see some of the bot traffic coming through your site. Um, so uh, I would have a look at those kinds of things and see if you can identify where the what's causing the bounce rate to drop in Google Analytics itself. That might help you decide um, what the problem might be. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, uh, let me just interrupt there. Rob Mars, um, uh, oh no, I'll, 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 uh, if, if you stick around, I, 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 I might have something that might be helpful. Um, okay. Um, our next uh, is uh, from Valentina Huff. Um, who wants to know a good way to advertise a website. Um, can anyone recommend a good way to advertise a website with the goal of getting people to vote for their favourite businesses online? Um, find the communities where people follow or interact with those sorts of businesses. For instance, you might um, you could do Facebook advertising, for instance, target people that like businesses that are like the types of businesses that you want people to vote for, and then maybe geo-target um, the advertising to target the city for instance, of the businesses that you're trying to get people to vote for, for, for instance, or, or simply target, geo-target the ads to a gender age group, for instance, in the city in question. Um, or you could run display advertising through Google doing the same sorts of things and do geo-targeted with demographic interests. Um, inside DoubleClick, you can target interests uh, interest categories and affinities to different types of websites. So you could set up display ads that are geo-targeted to an area. The customer meets um, male, female, um, and age, um, different age bandings, and has different interests, content interests online, like they're heavily interested in fashion or travel or whatever it might be, and um, put out display ads to those sorts of people. Um, what are the sorts of things that could you do? Um, you could see if you could get a um, like a partnership email with a fashion. Let's just say you were trying to target people that would be interested in fashion. Um, you might be able to buy advertising within a fashion website um, of some persuasion. Um, it could be an e-commerce website that does sales for fashion stuff or whatever. Um, and get something inside their website for display advertising, inside one of their emails, for instance, or um, a competition on their site, getting those visitors to vote for your businesses. Um, ultimately, uh, the simplest way I'd go about this is um, think about who the audience is that you want to vote for the businesses that you're trying to target or get the attention of. Um, and then think about where online those people congregate um, because they're the places that you want to try and get your ads displayed to have the impact that you want. Cool, um, Alistair. Um, anybody else with this? Well, we've um, done it again. Um, we've managed to cover all of the questions asked on the uh, uh, SEO questions community on Google Plus. Um, now we move on to the um, SEO news section of, of um, our week. Yeah, um, each week um, we uh, add topics of interest that popped up uh, um, during the week uh, to the 
SEO news community on Google Plus, and uh, if you search for us under the communities tab by typing in uh, um, SEO news and community, all three words, um, you'll find us. Um, and you can add items to be discussed too. Um, this this week um, we have. Um, uh, about six items to discuss. Uh, one was uh, posted by uh, uh, Edwin Yonk um, and uh, it was an article uh, um, in the SEM Post. Uh, Switching to HTTPS will not increase your search rankings. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting given the discussion that we had uh, with um, uh, somebody uh, not so long ago. Um, any comments on this one, guys? I think it's a little interesting that um, they've kind of recanted the, well, I shouldn't say recanted, step back a little bit from the SSL stuff. You know, they originally put it out and said that there's a, a small ranking boost. Now they've kind of down, they're not saying that it's not there, just that it's been downplayed. John Mueller's comment about this was, you know, that it's um, very subtle, for instance, as opposed to it being subtle, it's very subtle. Um, it is interesting that they've taken a, a step back, but maybe there's been a flurry of people thinking that switching over to SSL is going to give them a subtle but noticeable lift in rankings and people are getting it wrong. Um, maybe Google algorithms are detecting um, that there's more websites that are um, moving over to SSL and their bots are triggering um, a lot of additional SSL errors um, in terms of websites configurations and things like that, insecure content, poorly configured SSL certificates, cheap certificates that don't have the appropriate security, poorly configured web servers, you know, yada, 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 the list goes on and on and on. So maybe they're stepping away from it a little because too many people are moving and getting it wrong. Um, I, I would move to SSL if for no other reason than by moving to SSL you get to use um, Speedy. Uh, web rankings be damned, I would move for that. Um, who doesn't want their website to load 25 or 30 percent faster without having to make any changes to your application code or um, you know getting faster servers or faster databases or tuning queries or doing all of that jazz. So I, I still think that it's worth doing irrespective of the ranking boost. Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I um, um, well, I, I, I'm, this, this panel has, has been very cynical about um, the boost, and, and I think this, this article bears out um, what you guys um, have said um, for uh, um, an extended um, time. All right, uh, number 19. I just, um, yeah, I mean, I just wish, and like I said in the very beginning, that they did not use that small ranking advantage, you know, because it, right from the very beginning, a non, you know, a, 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 site, a static site that doesn't transfer any personal data, it's just a read-only site, you know, it just didn't make any sense for me in the very beginning, and it's like, you know, they should have just chosen their words more carefully, because the minute you say rank, in fact, are flipping out, the world's going to go mad. Well, at least the SSL people have had a, a really good Christmas bonus, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, there is that. Um, I, mean, I mean, Google's always saying they don't want to give away the secret sauce. Well, well you know, just don't. You know, STFU. Um, we really don't want to know what you think. Um, we'll make our own judgment on uh, what we see, not, not what you say. Um, 
Anyway, the next one uh, is um, on uh, an article which says that the new um, Google um, Panda update um, should help uh, small sites. Uh, uh, this this came out uh, last week, um, and um, Google is suggesting that um, uh, this um, uh, new update uh, could 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 help smaller sites. I, I suppose it's a it's aligned with changes in um, local search, I guess. Um, but anyway, uh, as always, I'd like to know what you guys think. Not much, apparently. No, look at it. It's just another update from Google, I think, right? You know, they say that it's designed to help some of the smaller sites. Um, I haven't read any um, specific analysis on this yet to see whether or not small sites specifically are winning more, necessarily. Um, I did see some stuff from a few people where they went through like a winners and losers list um, that they could see thus far from some of those big tools like the uh, search metrics of the world or things like that. And um, most of the sites that I looked at in whatever blog post that was in um, seemed as though they were bigger type of sites and they weren't really focusing on the little guys. Um, has anyone else seen any analysis of or reports of smaller sites winning? Not, not at the minute, uh, because of course all these, all the big tracking sites are only going to track the big boys, aren't they? That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. What I kind of have slightly noticed is in local for UK, some of the directories have taken a little bit of a drop back, and some of the more s social, m more local sites have actually started coming a bit more forward again. Um, if that may have been a result of it, it seems to be that some smaller sites are benefiting, but you know, to, to what extent, I'm not really sure yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see. Um, let's move on to number 20. Um, um, posted by, um, um, contributed, uh, curated by Micah Fisher Kirshner, um, the myth of Google's 200 ranking factors. Every now and then, a, a magical list of Google's ranking factors. Uh, is published and uh, earns thousands of shares and backlinks, uh, albeit uh, being just a, a sequence of uh, myths and misinformation. Um, yeah, the, the, the reason this article has credence, of course, is because it, it, it has been put together by uh, Gianluca Fiorelli, which, um, or who, I should say, uh, uh, is much um, respected around here. Um, guys, uh, any comments on, did anyone get to see uh, John Luca's um, uh, article? No, I haven't read it yet. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good. <laughs> it was just basically going into, well, where has this 200 ranking factors come from? And please, for dear Lord, stop producing these bloody articles. Um, no, it was really good. You know, he went back and he traced where the original 200 came from. He found it in a little, uh, you know, back in, I think it was an article from 2007 or something like that from Matt Cutts. And then, of course, that's been pounced on and every now and again. And then also he's looked into various different articles on these ranking factors which he just completely shows you where and, and how to dispel it. Uh, it was a real, you know, it was a good, it was a good read. It was a really good read. All right, and if you're looking to, um, to follow up on that um, 
article and, and um, find it. You'll find it in the SEO News community on Google+. Plus. Um, look for us in the communities tab by using all three words. Yeah. One thing I'd like to note with that is, is uh, I mean, I like <coughs> I like the um, factors on that, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's one thing doing it one or two times, but repeatedly without anybody um, uh, updating it or putting real thoughts in it, um, versus like yeah, the keyword density or something kind of is out there. But I really like kind of the focus and um, <coughs> really kind of pushing on um, people to, to, to up their game if they're going to do something like that. Yep. Okay, well, uh, we move on from uh, Jean-Luc here uh, to uh, um, one posted by uh, Edwin Yonk. Um, now, this was really interesting. Um, um, it was an advisory from uh, Google, I think, that uh, large pop-ups on websites could uh, trigger a, a page layout algorithm penalty. Um, originally uh, written by Jennifer Slegg. I haven't seen any of her articles before. It was very handy for me anyway. A mate, a mate uh, is, is just rolling out a new site and he, he, he uh, sent me an email asking about um, the, the pop-ups. Um, he had two little pop-ups, um, like a, a, instead of like on, on the page, um, it, it um, was a, a, a block of information which he had a, a read more and he was using a pop-up to put them, um, put them up. Um, and um, anyway, um, I, I, I had that article to, to um, pass on to him to make myself appear knowledgeable. Um, and um, I was able to say, look, just to be really safe, to just use the, you know, the, the hidden, hidden text and, and uh, reveal uh, um, on click. Um, yeah, what's, what's interesting <coughs> with that is... Um, it, it's a um, how to put it? it. It's one of those situations where like this doesn't affect very many people. Like it's like five percent for those who never run JavaScript. It's a one-time thing. Most people have shown that the bounce rates are actually lower when you have these types of things. It pisses off people for that really hate pop-ups. But for the most part. Yeah, we're talking maybe five percent of people or less, which happens just so happens to be the, the the group of Googlebot as well, where they will see this every single time, um, and you know it 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 creates um <laughs> it creates an interesting situation because like now you're looking at um you know, how do you handle something where it's, it's in theory, from a user standpoint, it's a small group, but it, it, it matters because um, Google is such a, it focuses in that area. Um, and at least, you know, there were some uh, suggestions and stuff about, say, you know, do it on the second visit or do it on the second page view or something like that, I think. And in a lot of ways, well, that kind of defeats the point of running it right away. Um, but it, you know it's valid on both ends of like you know if if you're running a no script or not no script but you, if you're not running cookies it, it gets to be really annoying if you're seeing this every single time um, and so what I thought was fascinating so well if you match these two up with like here are other articles talking about how to optimize these large full scale you know one time pop ups um, it'd be interesting to see some of the people respond about about this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Alistair, you, you're leaving us shortly. Thank you very much for your contribution tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll uh, see you next week. Thank you, mate. Channel. Excellent. Thanks a lot. See you guys. All right. Okay. Uh, our um, next one is another one posted by uh, Edwin Yonk. Um, from key, it, it's headed from keywords to search intent. Um, 
I haven't read this article, um, but I'll, tr I'll try and make some sense as I read it. Um, although high ranking and lots of traffic from competitive keywords may still work, the new SEO needs to look beyond these rather shallow metrics. Um, namely, Pam nearly, nearly argues uh, each search query is not just empty words. It holds an elusive but critical intent behind it, and that search intent contributes to conversion rate. Uh, in this sense, search intent is basically the user's aim. The query is their arrow, um, and hopefully your offer or opt-in or download is the target. Um, she continues with a list of four search intents and seven ways to determine them. What did uh, you guys? Oh, and it was published uh, on um, what are they, as with it under the title of what are they thinking? Seven techniques to decrypt search intent, and it was on the Semras blog. Micah, you have to leave us as well. Thank you very, very much for your uh, contribution. It, it's um, really appreciated. Uh-oh. Is there anybody still with me? <laughs> oh, okay. Mike, Mike is on a phone call. Um, Tim is probably on a phone call too, I think. Um, Masataki, are you with us? I'm here. Did you did you get time to read this article? Um, no, I'm afraid not. But it sounds like something we discussed last week, and it's giving me a horrible flashback to about 12 years ago when I had to take a and when I had to go to lecture on phenomenology. Um, Essentially, it's the idea that you can use different languages, different ways of describing the same thing. So, you know, the thing is your intent. That's what you want to achieve, what you want to do. You can express it in very many different ways. People will have you know, many ways of describing um, something. So let's say, um, describe to me what a cat is. Define what a cat is. You know, you might say, oh, it's a four-legged animal, um, you know, smaller than tiger. Um, or, you know, you could say, oh, it's a popular pet or whatnot. The cat is a cat. You know, there are many ways of describing that. Now, that question is, um, can people re deduce from the explanations or the way that they're trying to explain what a cat is that, it, that they're talking about the cat or not? Have I lost you? I probably have because I'm going completely bonkers. No, yeah. Well, look, uh, I, I'm 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 fascinated. Keep going. <laughs> no, so um, there are many ways of describing the same thing, um, and the thing is what you want. Um, and the trick for Google and other search engines, and indeed for us when we uh, engage in a conversation, is really to understand what the person is talking about what the person wants, what needs the person is presenting um, with. So in that sense, it's it's part of natural way that we react to things and uh, trying to understand what people are talking about and what people want to do. So in that sense, it's not it's nothing new, um, but it's increasingly the case that search engines are getting better at deducing what people's intentions are. Yeah, well, that's certainly true. Um, particularly when they, um, um, it, if, if the searcher conducts a second search or a third search, by the time that they've done that, that they, they've um, um, pretty well um, worked out exactly what uh, is required. Yeah, so the question is, you're not really looking for keyword or even search query as such, but making sure that what you have on your site meet, uh, meets the, the need and requirements of the searcher. 
whichever way that search searches, if that makes sense. You know, what kind of expression, whatever, however he or she describes his or her needs, that your site meets that needs and wants, as it were. So to that extent, you could say that you it's no longer, well, that would be pushing it too far, but it's really, in the long term, it's, it's not going to be the case that you're looking for, you're trying to, as it were, uh, go back the process and say, okay, so what, I have this product, I have this service, that do I want to sell? What would people be looking for? How would they be expressing themselves? Okay, these are the keywords that people are looking for. These are the things that they search for. Okay, I have to target these words and phrases. That may no longer be the no longer be the case. So long as let's say Google can deduce what the searcher wants, and then it can match. It understands your site and it understands the search intent, and it thinks that your site meets the needs of that searcher perfectly. Then, in a sense, it doesn't matter how the searcher expresses his or her intent. And maybe, pushing it, pushing the book out there, maybe that it doesn't really matter that what you put on your site um, will be of great, uh, of great consequence in terms of trying to mold your content with certain keyword and phrases in mind. Does that make sense? Have I gone off, um, off the rails? No, you, you haven't gone off the rails. It's just that my brain is old and, and uh, takes it on um, slowly. I'll, I'll, I'll re-listen to this tomorrow. Uh, it probably will sound worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll learn something. Um, what do you think, Tim? No? Okay. Um, I've, I've I've no idea, mate. I'm really sorry. Brain not functioning at the minute. I'm am suffering from the same melody. Masataki, would you like to talk more on this, or will we move to the next? No, I think I've I've embarrassed myself sufficiently. Nonsense. Um, I'm certain that um, what you've said is valuable. I know that much. Um, and th this one was a, another um, a panda, or the, the last uh, article we had from the um, uh, SEO uh, news community uh, um, is another one uh, on panda, according to Google, uh, affecting around about 3 to 5 percent of queries are, were affected. That's a high number. Um, they, they don't normally uh, throw out uh, updates. Um, that affect up to five percent. It's normally around about the one and two percent, isn't it? Yes, it does anyway, we. You go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that I agree that it it does seem to be a pretty big um, update. If it if it is indeed affecting three to five percent of the, is it three to five percent of search queries? That's what they said. Yeah. So that that's, you know, it could be as as much or as many as one in twenty. So that, that's a lot. Yep. It certainly is. Um, one in two. I mean, uh, I um, I haven't seen much happening on um, um, any of um, our client sites, but I must admit I've been rushed off my feet the last uh, two weeks um, and really haven't uh, kept up. Um, but, um, yeah. All right, look, um, I, I think um, we can call uh, this a wrap for the week. What do you think, guys? Yep. Okay. Well, look, um, we um, uh, still have viewers. Um, we're, we're going to green room now. We're, we're, we'll, we'll be having a chat. Um, 
Uh, I've just posted a link in the SEO questions community, the, 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 the top post there, which is uh, um, the uh, announcement of, of this um, Hangout. Um, I've put a link there which will bring you directly uh, in, into our, uh, uh, in, into this Hangout. You won't be on air, I'm just about to click the uh, stop uh, broadcast button and um, um, take it off the air, but you're more than welcome uh, to come and join us. Um, um, we, we find it easier to, to relax uh, after these um, hangouts when we're off the air. I hope you don't mind, but you're more than welcome uh, to join us. Any, anyway, I'd also like to thank you for your um, participation. Um, it's um, the... the um, um, there we go. Let's fix that. Uh, it, it, it's your, your interest in what we do that um, makes um, what we do worthwhile. Um, we'll be back at the same time next week uh, to do it again.